Major support for Carolina Business Review provided by Colonial Life, providing benefits to employees to help them protect their family, their finances, and their futures. High Point University, the premier life skills university, focused on preparing students for the world as it is going to be. And Sonoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. There is a lot of speculation and anticipation about some seminal event that we will call the great reopening of this economy. I'm Chris William, and welcome again to the most widely watched and longest running program on Carolina business policy and public affairs seen each and every week for the last three decades across the Carolinas. Thank you for supporting the dialogue. We'll start with our panel on just that. When is the great reopening of the economy or has it already happened? Stay with us. Starts in a moment. Gratefully acknowledging support by Martin Marietta, a leading provider of natural resource-based building materials, providing the foundation upon which our communities improve and grow. Blue Cross Blue Shield of South Carolina, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. Visit us at SouthCarolinaBlues.com. The Duke Endowment, a private foundation enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. On this edition of Carolina Business Review, Christopher Chung of the Economic Development Partnership of North Carolina, Susie Shannon from the South Carolina Council on Competitiveness, and Donald Thompson of Walk West. And welcome again to our program. We're glad to welcome Donald, Susie, Chris. Thank you all for joining us. Susie, you're going to you're going to get the first pitch for better or for worse. Ah, great. You know, we have we've been talking about now, uh, I think a lot of speculation, a lot of expectation around what the reopening of the economy looks like this this great reopening and we've almost maybe missed it. Has kind of the the economy already reopened? Chris, I would think so. Um, I mean, certainly when you when you look at certain segments or industry sectors, at least across South Carolina, we never really closed, right? Um, we're uh, heavy in advanced manufacturing and process, uh, logistics, um, and you know, over the past year, we stayed at home and we bought stuff, and we had to keep freight moving across our logistics corridors. So, um, I, I think to a great extent, um, we never really closed. Um, I think we're beginning to see an uptick, certainly in other segments like leisure, hospitality, tourism. I think you had Director Parrish on um, not that long ago. Um, and so we're going to, I think, begin to see some of the segments um, rebound much more quickly than, quickly than others as we begin um, more, moving more into that grand reopening process you're talking about. Donald, Christopher, what do you think? So one of the okay. things for, for me is I'm in a digital space, right? As a marketer, yeah. right? As, as a leader. So we were able to leverage, right? The technology uh, to keep things moving throughout the pandemic, but not so much for a lot of our clients. And so we saw significant amounts of pain for folks uh, in our organization and our, our clients, if you will, that were in that retail, that hospitality sector, but we are seeing things coming back. We are seeing people now thinking, talking, and working towards that new future. And one of the conversations we're in a lot is what does that hybrid workforce look like? What is in office versus that Zoom culture? What's that blend? Because a lot of folks have gotten now accustomed to working from home, working remotely, but we miss that team dynamic, that cultural shift. And we're looking at how do we blend those two worlds in the future? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and remember, Chris, I mean, we, we went uh, a long time there uh, in those maybe those first weeks and months of the pandemic last year when, yeah, there were a lot of different uh, businesses that, that closed. Everyone was trying to flatten the curve, if we all remember that phase of the pandemic. And certainly we are a long ways off from those very restrictive days across the entire country. I, I know Governor Cooper likes to use the metaphor a dimmer switch. That's really the approach North Carolina has taken. It's allowed the state to kind of modulate the different uh, abilities of businesses to open at various capacities. I think that's all been very helpful to balance both the public health response as well as obviously allowing the economic machine to continue employing people and cranking out the kinds of things that we want the economy to do. 
Uh, but uh, as I said, we're a long ways off from those early days of the pandemic. There's so much more optimism now with more and more people getting those vaccines uh, that, like you said, that grand reopening is, is imminent if, if we're not already in the midst of it right now. You know, Donald, I want to go back to something you said. And Susie, I'd love to hear your comments on that. Hey, Donald, at the beginning of this, we, you know, the shock, obviously, we're, we were in shock. We're trying to figure out what was going to happen and what the next way forward. And not to be insensitive to, as you talked about the pain of your clients and maybe even some of your colleagues, but this sense that we were all or nothing, that we we're going to be virtual and that's going to be the new model or, oh, wait, we're not going to be, or there's some hybrid. You know, we tend to live in these these areas of, of these, sometimes these extremes, but will, will getting back to normal is obviously going to have some type of virtual element to it, but how much of a virtual element and what does the new workspace look like? Yeah, I think that the last year, year and a half is going to have a significant impact on the way corporate cultures are driven uh, going forward. You can't now ask people or expect your top talent to now sit in a workspace that is not conducive to their lifestyle. So because of the pandemic, we've gotten data that says people can be productive with more flexible work schedules. They can be productive working at home. And now we can integrate the in-person meetings for that cultural uplift, for that uh, mentorship and leadership development. But at the same time, give people the ability to use all these tools in a way that suits them. I don't think the employers are gonna have that choice anymore. The top talent is gonna demand that there's work flexibility and environment. And I think we're ready for it. I think it's going to be a good thing. Does it keep, uh, Susie, does it keep South Carolina competitive? Does it keep your constituents competitive? I think so. You know, a, a lot of last year within the business and economic development world was almost like a tinker lab, right? I mean, we were already beginning to drift pre-pandemic to more um, heavy reliance on technology, uh, development, technology efficiencies, and certainly more remote workers um, as more and more uh, advanced speed uh, broadband was deployed. And so I think what you've seen is an acceleration happening before we were you know, already drifting in that direction. And now we've, we're just sort of moving at it at ludicrous speed to quote one of my favorite Mel Brooks movies. Uh, Chris, Tom Barkin, President and Chief Executive Officer of the, of the Richmond uh, branch of the Federal Reserve has said on this program, and he said uh, several places that there is a, a quote unquote, a skills mismatch uh, coming out of just D D Donald's comments and Susie's comments, this skills mismatch is even more exacerbated now because people are unmotivated. Some people are unmotivated to not take that federal support and still stay at home. Is there a different answer to come at this idea of putting together folks that need jobs, want jobs with those jobs that need to be filled? I don't think the solution has changed much. I mean, this was certainly a topic of conversation among the economic development industry, even before the pandemic, right? This, this, uh, whether it's manufacturing, construction, healthcare, uh, you just had a lot of these different industries that were finding it very difficult to attract and retain the types of skilled workers that, that every industry depends on. And again, that was, that was not unique to the pandemic period. Uh, that's something that we saw leading up to that the pandemic, I think, has exacerbated that challenge, as you said, whether that's because of the availability of unemployment uh, payments at a federal and state level, or frankly, I think much more people just genuinely concerned about going back to the workplace if they're a frontline essential worker. It's You, you got to think about your own health. You got to think about your loved one's health. That makes it a very personal decision, uh, not to mention if kids are not able to go to school or can't go to their daycare. If for some of those parents, they've had to stay on the sidelines, not get back to the workforce. So you've got all these things that are making it even more difficult for employers to find workers. I still think the solution, though, is still about understanding what businesses feel like they will need in those skill sets and aligning the educational institutions, K through 12 and higher ed, to produce the types of talent and soft skills that employers are demanding and think that they'll be demanding five to 10 years from now. Donald, how do you characterize that? You're a creative I, thinker. Yeah, I'd like to extend on what Chris was describing in terms of that, that matching, right? And, and that matching has to do with that university infrastructure, but it also has the ability to upskill workers when they have to do a career transition, right? And so one of the things that we're seeing uh, is what kinds of opportunities do people have, for example, right, is social media analysts, 
Well, that doesn't require a four-year degree. You can get certifications, you can get retrained. And so we have to make sure that we provide an infrastructure for people where they may have one career that is moving towards a dead end. What are the skills they have that can be reapplied, right? in a growing industry where they don't have to uproot their family, but they can take the skills they have and take them to the next level. And I think it's within our capacity to do it, especially when we look at the power of community colleges, certificate programs, all the things that are in place, we just got to talk to each other a little bit better. Well, about listen, what it, oh, go ahead. I was, Chris, I was gonna say, I mean, I, and I think the pandemic has shown, shown the light on where companies and employers may be moving towards things like increasing use of automation, right? I think the pandemic has shown the risk of being too dependent on a, essentially a human labor force. If you can automate some of those processes, use technology to displace a human worker, that certainly makes you less vulnerable next time there's this type of public health crisis. And so what do you do, to Donald's point, about some of those individuals who no longer can go back to those industries or those businesses because they have automated or switched over to some sort of technology? How do you upskill those individuals to go into higher demand fields where there is a need for, again, yeah, human workers, uh, to, to use a, a kind of a funny term, I guess? Yeah. Is, is, Susie, Donald just talked about the community colleges and uh, South Carolina's technical colleges, North Carolina community colleges have typically been the leadership or leaders in that area of trying to do just what we're talking about. Can they do it? Do they need more money? Is the situation of what this public health care, or this public health crisis caused, um, will the unintended consequence be that these community colleges and technical colleges will be able to do this better? What do you think? What do you think is holding back the, the matching of the of the talent with the jobs? Um, well, I, I, I'm sure our colleges and our universities would always say more 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 resources, more funding, more money is always appreciated and and highly encouraged and embraced. Um, and certainly the Carolinas two-year uh, systems are, are a model for the rest of the country, right? Whether it's uh, degree, associate degree training, certificate training, um, rapid training um, in South Carolina, on the South Carolina side, it's called Ready SC program. Mm -hmm. Applied learning obviously is a huge component and we're seeing more and more companies clamor for um, on the job training coupled with that fixed content learning. So, so I think that communication, uh, closing that divide between the business community and the educational community so that, you know, the, the, the colleges and universities understand that their training focus today needs to actually be on the jobs of tomorrow, mm -hmm. right? And, and I think it's the business community um, and those inside of that, those concentric circles that understand best what those emerging trends are and where we're moving with respect, for instance, to machine learning and, and automation. Uh, can't, can't have a successful business without having infrastructure in place. One of the things that has bubbled to the top over the last 12 to 14 months has been the last mile of broadband connectivity to the most rural areas. Donald, is this a foregone conclusion now that it's, it's just about funding, it's just about finding the money, but everyone seems to be looking in the same direction and singing out of the same page of the hymn, hymnal on this? I, I think that's, I would agree with that, right? Because I think that access to high-speed internet and that infrastructure opens up a different learning capacity, different communication capacity a different access to what's going on in your environment and how you can fit into that environment. It's no different than not having access to your, it, you and I, we get in the car, we're two or three minutes away from any kind of food service store that we need. When you're part of a rural community, you have to make sure that everything is done well, well in advance. When you bring broadband, it increases the knowledge base, number one, and the types of jobs that young people can go after and train for. We're in a digital economy. So that means when you have a lack of broadband, that means the young people that are coming up don't become naturally, naturally skilled as quick in the digital tools. And so you actually increase the opportunity divide unintentionally when all we have to do is make that access available so that now we can create more of those folks that can take advantage of the digital economy. I think it's smart, I think it makes sense, and I think it's just the right thing to do. Susie, do you think South Carolina, the General Assembly, the State House, if you will, do they have the, the, the will to find those dollars and to make that, that, that last mile connected? 
Yeah, I, I think the political will is there. And, and, and luckily for the state, we, we actually moved in into the pandemic uh, fallout and you know, moving into that big grand reopening um, much more better, uh, uh, much more financially in a, in a better financial posture, um, if you will. And so monies have already been allocated um, and, and it's sent over into the designated agency. There's additional monies that are tracking through the legislature. You know, at, at one time, you know, in economic development, prospect world, you know, you could build a, a, a nice spec building out in the middle of a rural area and expect the companies to, um, to be induced to come in. You know, over the last few years, there's been more of a shift to companies wanting to site to where the workers already are. And, you know, getting to Donald's point, it's, it's about character of life and quality of life and broadband now is essential to that uh, good character of life, just like electricity and, you know, basic phone service and proximity to a, a grocery store. Mm -hmm. uh, Chris, in, in North Carolina and in South Carolina, both Raleigh and Columbia in the General Assemblies have been uh, made a priority to the idea of business liability and especially unique to COVID, that businesses did not want to have to face lawsuits based on COVID liability. Uh, where is North Carolina with that? Clearly they've taken it seriously as South Carolina has, but do you feel like there are ample protections now for businesses? Well, I think that probably would depend on the business that you ask, but generally speaking, if the fact that we don't hear about this from the companies that we interact with on the front line of doing economic development suggests that North Carolina is probably doing something right in this regard. Companies don't see North Carolina's liability regulations as unduly onerous. Obviously, no one has ever had to navigate a global pandemic in, in this lifetime of, of public policy making. So I think folks are sort of learning about where those limits should be uh, should be appropriately drawn. But like I said, it's not something that comes up when we're out there talking to companies either about locating in North Carolina or if they're already here, expanding here. And so the fact that we don't hear about it would suggest that this is not an issue that has been causing companies any pause about investing and in creating jobs in North Carolina. And again, that, that's good, right? You know, companies look at this universe of issues, everything from regulatory climate to taxation, to quality of life, to skilled workforce availability, and as well as we can be doing on any of those different dimensions, it's just going to increase our probability of, of successfully growing the economy uh, through business and investment. Um, Donald, North Carolina's new secretary, relatively new secretary of commerce, Secretary Michelle Sanders, yeah. said that she publicly said that she wanted to create a more, in, and I'm going to read this, a more inclusive economy. Uh, what is more important, diversity or inclusive, inclusiveness? Well, that's kind of like asking me, right, what's more important about money, right, heads or tails, right? You need both in order for it to actually be a spendable form of currency. And so I think the biggest thing is that people lump things together. So when you think about diversity, people then think about racial equity. But diversity, equity, inclusion has to do with generational diversity, diversity of thought. It has to do with neurodiversity. There's a lot of elements in the kaleidoscope of DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Those things aligning together allow companies to be stronger in building the culture they want. And quite frankly, when you think about 67% of workers look at the diversity, equity, inclusion numbers of a company before they decide to go work with a firm, now we're talking about the impact level of DEI. So when you think about diversity, equity, inclusion, it can't be just through the lens of the moral outcry, which matters, mm -hmm. but for business owners, for people in the general assemblies to understand, take notice and act, how do the numbers align with the outcome objectives that people want? Give you a case in point. Google just announced a, uh, a plant in uh, Durham that they're gonna build, right? Thousand new jobs. One of the reasons they selected North Carolina, one of the reasons they selected Durham in particular is because of the access to a multicultural group of employees that they could recruit from. So when you think about economic development, when you think about corporate health and resiliency, diversity, equity, inclusion just can't be ignored. And you can look at it from any angle you want, but we've got to address it and we've got to think about it. Donald, let me, let me use your words. And I'm, I think I know the answer to this question, but I need to hear you articulate this. And, and Chris, Susie, please jump in on this as well. 
Donald, you compared the killing of George Floyd last year. Tragic event, of course, but you said it was an earthquake in our society. Interesting turn of phrase. Um, does that passion moment, does that tragedy become, um, uh, uh, does it become institutionalized and the, the moment that it represented, not just the tragedy, the personal tragedy, but how do you stay, how do you keep that passion to make sure that, that it, diversity, equity, and inclusion doesn't become just another checkbox or a silo within an organization? Yeah, I appreciate the question very much because that catalyst moment was so impactful because it was on video and because we all experienced seeing that and it got to the core of human decency. And see, a lot of times when you think about racial inequity, social justice, people, their experience might not allow them to empathize because of their background or perspective. But we saw a black man murdered on live television and that can't be ignored. So now to your question about whether it has sustained power in terms of the CEOs and leaders and people in government, my optimistic side says yes. I'm talking to people every day that want to move from why DEI matters to how do we do it and link it with our business strategy so we make it a board level imperative so that it stays sticky. We link it to economic development of our cities so it stays sticky. We put it into our school infrastructure. So we're talking about disability and inclusion, someone that's blind, low vision, so our websites are better. We link diversity, equity, inclusion to the things we all touch each and every day, and that's the way it stays in the fabric of what we're doing. Susie? Yeah, you know, Donald talked about the impact level, right? Um, it, I recently, couple of years ago. So this was, you know, um, you know, pre the, the tragedy of George Floyd, um, interviewing a young candidate, you know, young as in chronologically young, and uh, also young in their career. And it, you know, their questions back to me as their interviewer wasn't so much wrapped around, um, you know, what are my fringe benefits? What am I going to be paid? You know, can I work from home on Fridays? It, it was asking about the corporate official posture, not just the culture inside, you know, informally inside of, of the organizational team, but actually the, you know, the official posture on certain social issues. So that seemed to weigh heavily into, you know, a candidate's decision whether or not to come and work for, you know, us or anyone else. Mm -hmm. And, and I'll add, you know, as just from two, two perspectives, as, as an employer ourselves at, at the EDPNC, we've got about 65 employees. So the sample size is still pretty small. But as we've had uh, hiring needs over the past year, uh, we've certainly seen that question come up uh, from candidates about what are our DEI policies, what are our initiatives as an organization. So that definitely uh, corroborates uh, Donald's point about how especially younger generations, I would say, are a lot more attuned to this even than than millennials and certainly a Gen Xer like myself, it's just a lot more important of a priority as they decide where to uh, where to go to work. And then, of course, from an economic development standpoint, we've certainly seen companies put a lot more premium on issues around a, a diverse and inclusive uh, workplace, a diverse workforce, uh, issues around sustainability, which of course tie into issues like environmental justice. I, I think there's clearly a focus on these things, and I, I know that you know, Chris, your point was you don't want this to be a checkbox, right? I think most people can sense when there's an authentic desire to make progress on these. And they're also going to sense when people are just doing this so that they can check a box and say, yeah, we, we've, we've been diverse, we've been inclusive, let's move on to the next issue. And so I think both as employers, as well as as states trying to attract business investment, you know, these are things that we have to really believe in and authentically pursue. Otherwise, I think it's going to be very apparent uh, that we are just trying to check a box and that's not really how we want to make progress as a society on these issues. It's so, so Donald, you know, back to the, back to the point that if it is widely being accepted by a certain demographic, younger demographic, maybe maybe other demographics and those that traditionally dig their heels in for change because maybe they're afraid, maybe they truly don't believe it's the best thing. Do you find barriers and, and we've got about we've got less than a minute. Do you find that those barriers are breaking down that people are genuinely open minded or becoming open minded or approaching being open minded? Well, there's always barriers when someone doesn't understand 
but are being forced to learn something new, right? That's a typical challenge of learning, yeah. right? And, and that's whether it's DEI or others, but to make the point very succinctly, yes, there are barriers, but there is enough momentum developing that those barriers will be broken through. And what people have to decide is what side of history they want to be on and how they want to win in the marketplace. There's two things. There's the historical, the moralistic component, but then how do you want to win in the marketplace? And that's a real decision that companies have to make. And what candidates are looking for is not that all of a sudden your company is DEI ready, but what is your game plan? How are you intentionally moving forward? You may just start with broadening your recruiting base, right? And you're not going to change tomorrow, but what are the things you're doing to build that momentum over time? People appreciate that. Donald, that, that'll be the last word. Thank you for that. Uh, Christopher, always nice to see you. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Susie, welcome to the dialogue. We hope you'll come back and don't scare you off too easily, I hope. Thanks uh, for having me. It's my second one. <laughs> thank, you, thank you all for joining us. Hope your weekend is good. Thank you for watching our program. If you have any questions or comments, carolinabusinessreview.org. Until next week, I am Chris William. Happy weekend. Good night. Major funding for Carolina Business Review provided by High Point University, Martin Marietta, Colonial Life, The Duke Endowment, Sonoco, Blue Cross Blue Shield of South Carolina, and by viewers like you. Thank you.